Hey guys, it's Sarah and welcome to my studio. So this past week, Affinity dropped a major update for their software. And if you guys who are familiar with here with me on the channel know that it is one of my primary softwares that I like to use. Since they've been partnered with Canva about a year ago, everybody was kind of worried they were gonna end up going to that subscription model. Instead, they surprised everybody this past week with dropping a major update saying that the Affinity software is now going into all one unit, so kind of an all-in-one tool, and they're making it free forever, at least theoretically. We kind of live in this age where I think everybody hears that word and goes, yeah, what's the catch? If it's free and you're not paying for it, then you're the product. There's that concern that what is it that you want from me? And especially I know with creators and some AI data harvesting, that's also a concern and a valid one. Affinity's actually built in some of their tools with AI in the past, but they leave them automatically off so that if you want to use them, you need to actually go in and turn them on. Canva is also a huge component of using AI tech. And I know this is kind of a polarizing subject for people. What they've done now instead is rather than trying to blend all of it together and force you to use the tech, technology. They've gone and taken the Affinity Suite and offered it free sans AI. So if you want to use their AI tools, you have to pay for a Canvas subscription. And this is a huge thing for the designer community because this is sort of a, a great tool for people kind of like me where we're not completely, you know, hobbyists, no graphic design experience, but we don't also necessarily have the budget built in or work for a design company where you have access to the Adobe tools and you don't necessarily want to be paying that constantly. We live in an age where so much of our stuff is subscription based and you're paying for the right to use things that it gets overwhelming and you kind of start trying to figure out what do you prioritize in subscription land. There are some things that I am willing to pay for a subscription for. I'm willing to pay for a Shaper 3D subscription. It's software that I really like, I appreciate it, and I want to use it. I know it may not be in budget for everybody. I make it part of my budget here, especially with the channel. And I know there are alternatives that you can use that are free. Everybody constantly talks about Blender and Tinkercad, and I just kind of struggle. I keep trying, and I don't like Tinkercad's interface you should work with what works for you. And Shaper works for me, so I build that in. But at the same time, I'm familiar with Photoshop's tools and Adobe Illustrator. But a big minus is the subscription model and the expensive subscription model for Adobe software versus Affinity where it was the one time, but it was lacking some occasional tools that was a bit frustrating. And that's actually what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna show you guys the Affinity software and this awesome feature that they finally brought to the software. And that is of course, Image Trace. Now, if you're like me, a lot of times you like to design things and often maybe design things on sort of raster software, namely, of course, being Procreate. I like creating little sticker designs and turning these into pins. And I do the primary initial design often in Procreate. Sometimes I'll draw them in vector, but many of these were done on Procreate. So I have them in a raster format. In order to create a 3D model from that design, I need to get a sketch going. There's more than one way to do that. I've shown how you can really just take a raster image and convert it using um, Bamboo Labs um, image to keychain function. That's a you know quick and efficient way to do it. But I also think it's important to know how to do this from a modeling perspective as well, like taking an actual sketch and then creating the model because you never know if a program or a website is going to completely disappear. I don't think that's likely to happen, but we have no control over it. That software could suddenly be sunsetted and disappear. That happens all the time. So it's important to know how to do this. And with the modeling for my pins, it's usually pretty easy. It's a simple extrusion, but I need to have a good sketch base. Now the challenge of course then becomes how do I take my raster image and turn it into a sketch that I can use inside 3D modeling software. And usually the best way to do that is to convert that image using some form of image conversion to essentially a vector format. Now there's been a couple ways to do that. You can use some online conversion software such as Convertico, or there are a number of programs, including Adobe Illustrator, as well as Inkscape. I know a couple of people told me that you can do that as well, is where you can actually just 
trace the image, have the software trace the image, look at it, and create the vector file from that. It's fairly standard design practice. You can even do that in Xtool actually, but it has not been available for the Affinity Suite software. And it's been asked for for years and years. It's like one of the top re requests on the forum site before their forum disappeared recently. They added that to the new upcoming software. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the process of taking one of my sticker designs and converting it to a sketch file that can be read in 3D software. So let me show you how it works and I'll give you a quick interview over the Affinity software interface before I open up my file and we run through the image tracing process. By the way, before we get started, if you could take a moment and look down below, see if you see the hype button and if you could maybe tap it just to help give this video a little bit of a boost in the algorithm. It's a new feature that YouTube's using for channels that are on the small end and their definition of small is less than 500,000 subscribers. I'm like a little minnow here swimming in the YouTube ocean, so any help is appreciated. So when you go to launch Affinity, you'll get a little welcome screen and it'll have any recent documents that you're working on as well as some tutorials and such. Otherwise, you've got this interface here and I will just kind of go ahead and throw a new one on just to have something open so I can work here. So they've combined everything essentially into one big interface now. This might bother some people. It doesn't really bother me a whole lot because truth be told, I wasn't doing a lot in Affinity Photo. There were only maybe a couple features that I used in Affinity Photo. So moving those over into the, what would eventually be the Affinity Designer software. And I didn't do much with Affinity Publisher, but that's also been added. And they do that primarily up here with the different workspaces as they call them essentially. You've got vector, pixel, layout. In Affinity Designer, you already had a vector workspace and a pixel workspace and could go back and forth between the two of those. You also have this new one, Canva AI. And then if you click the three dots, you actually have all sorts of different ones here. They've created a color grading one, topography, compositing. And then if you don't want to see them, you can turn them off. If you're not interested in Canva AI, click it off. It won't, you know, don't have to deal with that. I don't even want to see layout, truth be told, because I don't use it, but they're here if I need them. And on top of that, you can actually really create and sort of customize your workspace, add additional buttons and such. There's a couple of cool videos online that show you this. I'm not really gonna go into that today because our focus today is going to be on creating a sketch for 3D you know, modeling software. So I really only need the features in Vector. So the big one, of course, being image trace and then obviously playing around with my layers panel a little bit. Let me get my pin file open and let's get this process a test. I'm gonna play around with the design and I'm gonna sort of give myself two examples. I'm going to use the color one that I've got as well as a version that is just black and white, just to kind of see how the software manages. And then of course, kind of taking that design over to Shaper 3D as a test to see how well they work. Is there one method that works better than the other? So what you're gonna wanna do is you're going to want to select your picture. And since I had opened this up, as just the PNG, I basically click the background and it selects it. And then you're gonna go to vector and you're gonna go to image trace. And this is gonna pop up. What you're seeing right now, you can see based on the changes here, is the image tracing. And you've got some options here for trying to look at it. Like this is the, if I were to move it, it's a little easier. You can see that it actually does the colored model really well. It identifies all the lines, even actually smooths out the circles a little bit, I'm impressed. So it identified that one pretty easy. Over here, it looks like I lost some things. It found, it was missing the little holes for the eyeballs and then these lines here, but the coloring actually kept it a little bit better. Now all of this can be adjusted based on your curve and your edge threshold. For instance, if I go over here and maybe play around with my settings a little bit, See if this changes things at all. Not a whole lot, but yeah, I can see over here where it changes a little bit with the mouth and such. I'm gonna go with that. I like how this one turned out. I feel like this will do pretty well. I know I missed some things here, but that's okay. I kind of like how this looks. So I'm gonna click apply. If I expand here, you'll see I've got all of these curves and it has separated out pretty well. If I go here, you'll see if I click on and I were to hide this, you'll see that it's got sort of a multi-layer going on. It's got this bigger circle underneath, and then it has the 
yellow circle that was in the middle. And it does it in layers as well. If I were to take away the white, if I were to take away the white, you'll see that it actually saw this as one big shape. Now I'm gonna do two different things. I'm going to start, well, first of all, I'm going to select all this one because, well, that's weird, weird little lines that it did. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that. Is there anything weird here? No. So I'm gonna take a moment and I'm gonna grab a copy of this. I'm gonna paste. That way I've got another one. And now I'm going to do a little bit of prep work on the one here, because I wanna see how these look going in over to the 3D software. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this one and I'm going to kind of do some subtraction and such, basically some shape compilation. So I just have like the little frame here and I don't have the colors. And since what I mean here is it's like, I've got this black shape and then I've got the white shape. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my pathfinder there, 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 I moved over here and subtract the front and that'll take that out and then do kind of the same thing with some of the other shapes. One final step before I convert them is I want to take all of these and I want to set the infill to, to nothing. That way they all just have these really thin lines. This seems to translate the best when I send it over to Shaper 3D when I export it out as a DXF. I am going to go ahead and go File, Export, and then I'm going to select my format, which for me is DXF, Preserve the Vectors. You get a little window here where you can kind of see it. Everything should pretty much be left alone. And then I'm going to export it. And then we'll take it over to Shaper and see how these turn out. Okay, we're over here in Shaper. I've got things opened up and we are gonna go ahead and add our sketch. Let me do that by clicking add and then file. And I'm going to go ahead and grab my soup can pin and it's gonna bring these in and we're gonna click okay. Now you can see both of these have come in and they both look pretty much the same. Looks like everything split out pretty well. No problems there. So now it should just be a matter of essentially extruding the shapes that I want in order to create my pin shape. And typically what I do is I grab both my border pieces here. And then we are going to go ahead and extrude. And I usually extrude the pins to a thickness of 1.5 millimeters. You can see all of those extruded pretty well. No problems, it looks like. So I'm just gonna take a moment, I'm gonna put the sketch back in real quick. And I am going to grab these planes here and pull all of them up. Actually, there's an easier way to do this. I'm gonna take all of these bodies and I'm going to put them in a folder. I'm gonna hide that group. And then what I'm gonna do, view the top. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to select everything, but I'm only gonna select the faces when you're holding down F. That way I can just extrude them up one millimeter. And then I can show all of these again. And now everything's all set and ready to go. And then I really just have to grab all of these bodies and I can make them all one shape and it union just fine. I'm gonna grab all of these again, same thing, all one shape. So these are my pin models. Doing it the same way, converting a color design and then trying and converting the color design to the black. And both of these honestly came out exactly the same. So it didn't end up mattering that I had to do all of this splicing. The color design that went in on Affinity did just fine. I didn't have any issues with the DXF when it was exported, which is good because sometimes it can get a little bit weird. But even if we were to just go ahead and like hide the bodies, and take a look at this sketch over here in sketch mode. Looking at it, this is actually a pretty clean looking sketch. Like I'm actually kind of impressed because I know this still probably looks a little wonky with all of these extra points, but I've honestly imported sketches that I've created using image trace in other functions and it's had like points clear out here. So this is actually a nice sketch. The image trace function seemed to work pretty well for creating a good sketch for 3D printing at least using this design. You're gonna get obviously some different mileage depending on the complexity of your image trace. And this one obviously was fairly straightforward, but it did a really good job with matching the colors. And 
even though I went through the process of doing all the slicing to create just one single vector sketch without the additional shapes, it ended up not mattering. This ended up creating a perfectly acceptable design. They came out looking absolutely identical and were able to do what I wanted. No issues with extruding or creating shapes whatsoever. So I'm pretty happy with this and I really only need the one body. So I'm just gonna delete that one. So I'm going to go ahead and export this and send it over to Bamboo Studio and we'll get it colored and the plate set up and then I will get it printed. So I've got my pin in here and now we're just gonna do some quick coloring. I've loaded the colors and then I'm gonna use some red, yellow, white, and then of course my gold, maybe do more red print. Let's get this painted real quick. So I'm going to do the flood real quick. Oh, that's right, I am gonna need a gray, aren't I? And then I am actually gonna need a gray and I'm gonna need a black, I forget about that. So grab, I'll turn this to black and then I am going to need a gray. Haha, <laughs> and it loaded a gray for me, like it, almost like it heard me. That's my little pin guy and I'll get him set up for printing multiples on a plate. Usually fill the bed with copies. And then I will grab my settings, flip over to a 0.2 millimeter nozzle, and then my enamel pin setting, which I have as a layer height of 0.12. I do um, some ironing on the top surfaces just to make it look a little bit smoother. Strength, speed, support, and all of that pretty much unchanged. So slice the plate. It's gonna take about nine hours to print and I'll get 15 pins out of it. That's about normal. I probably won't print as many for this project, but that's pretty common. But that's everything, so I will get those to print. One print and a coat of resin later, and you have a lovely new enamel pin. Ta-da! I thought these turned out pretty cute. So that's pretty much all I have for you today. I know I've gone over creating enamel pins before in the past, and I've got a couple other videos on the subject that I'll leave a link to but this video was primarily on how we've got this new tool in Affinity where it will make, I think, pin design or even just 3D modeling in general. If you're going from some sort of sketch that you've created to wanting to extrude that design, this is a great tool as sort of an interim and it doesn't cost anything anymore. I'm sure I'll probably do more video tutorials with Affinity, especially once they drop the iPad version of their software. That's coming soon, it's not available yet. But anyway, I wanted to just kind of show you guys how to do this. If you'd like to see more content like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications. Also, if you could take a moment and hit the like button to tell the Eldritch algorithm that this video was a good one. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.